I will very quickly say that one of the things that I do now is I teach undergraduates, and that's in part because I see how much work that we have to do, and so I'm touched by the emphasis on uh, bringing younger people into the field, and also the excitement uh, and the curiosity for new approaches like RDOC. So, um, no financial conflicts. Uh, I was working at the National Institutes of Mental Health when RDOC started, I was a seminal member of that group, and I've remained on at NIMH uh, as a member of the internal working group. So, very quickly, I'm going to talk to you about limitations in diagnoses. Some of these will be familiar, so I think I can go through these pretty quickly. I want to get across to describe what the RDOC initiative is, including the structure and the approach, and I want to talk about what's happening now with RDOC and what, uh, how we can go forward with it. So, when I teach my students, I say to them, first, I want you to consider some causes of a fever. And think about this for just a second. You go to your physician, and your physician says to you, oh, you have a fever, let me give you an anti-fever medication. And they all laugh when I say that, well, this is what we do with depression in many ways, right? Because there are many causes, as we saw from Professor Fava, many causes that lead to the pathway to depression. And this problem illustrates reification. In some ways, we have taken depression and made it maybe bigger than it is. And this tendency to believe is a very strong one. Steve Hyman has pushed this. Um, and especially when there's no real entity, if I can go on to this, uh, rest of this quote by John Stewart uh, Mill, we will still look for something, um, even if it's more abstruse and mysterious. In practice, this has consequences. Marketed psychiatric drugs work about half the time some a little better, some a little less. And so this is thought to believe for the reasons of the heterogeneity in our diagnostic system. And this is part of what our doc really wants to address. The consequences are stunning for research into new pharmacologic targets, roughly a drop of 50% uh, of investigations into new targets. Uh, between uh, 2009 and 2014. Pharma wants targets to help. And one of the things that we see is, and I'll do this quickly, is that when we move across units, we see strong connections that, are, that occur, we can develop between, say, a gene and a cell or a cell in a system. But the greater distance that we go, we span this system, the more difficulty we encounter. How did we get here? If you look at the bottom here, you will see the number of diagnoses that led up to our DSM-5 in the US. And you can see there are seven diagnoses that originally were drawn from the census up to the war report, which was the basis for the DSM-1. Uh, you can see we started with 106, and then there's this explosion that occurred. And this explosion, whoops, this explosion um, happened in the lead up to the DSM-3 with the Fainer criteria. Those are the RDC criteria, not the RDOC, which comes in 2009. And so a group of renegade psychiatrists in the, moved to the St. Louis area, perhaps because they had a bad experience with their psychoanalysis, I'm not sure about that, 
um, but they said we wanted to change things, and we wanted to change things in such a way that we could have reliable diagnoses. They also were concerned with validity, and so these are the tenets of validity for the DSM disorders that Robbins and Guzet laid out, who are part of that group. And clinical description is by far the greatest, but to date, our laboratory studies are wanting. We can identify laboratory uh, phenomena, biologic differences, but the mapping of those back to the symptoms are not clear. Delineation from other disorders, um, follow-up study in course, family study in genetics, the evidence is a bit stronger, but still we could criticize some there. So, in essence, the DSM sacrificed validity for reliability. You've had examples of these already, so this part is easy. One of the things is the polythetic criteria sets. Two people can meet criteria for major depressive disorder, and if we count weight gain and weight loss as separate symptoms, none of them could, each of them could share none of the symptoms in common. Borderline personality disorder, a study that, a disorder that I study, there are 256 combinations of symptom criteria. Comorbidity, the high degree of co-occurrence, we see this as in uh, Mauricio's talk about the co-occurring at the same time, but importantly, what Professor Van Oss talks about with the sequence from disorders like neurotic, uh, neuroticism to depression or anxiety to depression. So something happens in a pathway as the mechanisms uh, unfold. Uh, in some of my work, there's been components and endophenotypes, and there's been a, a lot of that work that's been very valuable. Uh, some of that also described that's really given us some advantages to move forward. Our staple, and you can see this all through the DSM-5 for how we define a disorder, is from Jerome Wakefield, and we all know how important that subjective distress or not being able to do your job or have your relationships is. We all know that the internal mechanism is important, but I highlight that because it really is vague when we connect that to our clinical problems. So why do these mechanisms matter? If you look here at this fear potentiation, oops, this is a little fickle. Fear potentiation, and what you're looking here is a test where you can startle somebody either when they're under stress or not under stress. And if you look across the diagnoses here, what you'll see is think, starting a single incident PTSD, and we're going down to more and uh, less specific types of anxiety all the way to a multiple trauma PTSD, okay? So this is the difference, almost linear, depending on the extent of the environmental stresses that these people have encountered of the fear potentiation. And why do we care? Well, if we ask these people to report their subjective state of arousal, this is the result. These are the same patients, and they're reporting the exact same thing. So if you're a clinician and you're hearing this, you may not be able to differentiate how you would treat somebody differently with a single incident PTSD versus somebody with a multiple incident PTSD. And in fact, if we think about fear potentiation, fear conditioning, and exposure therapy, this may be one reason why a lot of people with PTSD drop out of exposure therapy. It might work really well when it's this fear connection that is at the heart of the mechanism, but when it becomes uh, encumbered with all the things involved with multiple institute, uh, multiple uh, event trauma, then it may not be effective at all because there's other mechanisms that have uh, become involved. So with the NIMH project, we want better links to internal mechanisms to lead us to better constructs, better constructs 
to better, to more effective treatments. In essence, a person, personalized approach to treatment. So in the case of the multiple versus single incident PTSD, perhaps a fear potentiation startle test could tell us who would be benefited, who would benefit from exposure therapy. And the NIMH strategic plan um, in response to investigators in the U.S. who are having difficulty getting applications funded because of the complexities of comorbidity in the DSM, put forth in the strategic plan a new way to classify behavior with the goal to link basic and behavioral components of normal and abnormal functioning. RDOC is a framework. It's really a structure to build on translational research that's been done. It's a grant-funded initiative. NIH is spending money on it in the U.S. It's leading toward a classification system to validate dimensional constructs. So like Professor Van Oss was talking about, we need to capture the entire dimension, especially those uh, NOS categories, to bring in the full range of the dysfunction and maybe where it, the disruption becomes significant. Ultimately, the goal is to help patients for the reasons I've been stating. RDOC is not a substitute for the DSM or the ICD. It's not a clinical diagnostic manual, and it's not a fait accompli. It is akin to an open source code. I'm going to go through and describe this briefly to you. I'm going to go a little bit faster um, in the interest of time. Um, and I will bring us to um, some snapshots from the NIMH web page um, that will help illustrate this more quickly. So think of the broad picture right now. The organization of the matrix is units of analysis and domains that go across the rows. And within domains are constructs and subconstructs. The units of analysis are genes, molecules, cells, circuits, sometimes brain areas because we do not know enough about circuits yet, but we do know that there are areas that are critical to certain circuits, physiology, behavior, and self-reports. There are five domains. I'll go through each one of these. And pardon me for speeding along here. Negative valence systems, all of these have a clinical rationale. So these are the systems, the mechanisms that are involved in loss, harm, threat, and observable in a range of anxiety and stress and trauma-related disorders. Constructs include acute threat, which you might recognize as fear, potential threat, anxiety, sustained threat, loss, or frustrative non-reward. So you all have the idea of the structure. As I go through these, positive valence systems. Approach motivation systems can be disrupted. Reward can be disrupted to the extent that there's excessive, excessive reward seeking or diminished response to anticipated positive outcomes. Again, these will be on the website, so you can look at these constructs. But they are here to illustrate uh, what we see for constructs. Cognitive valence, ubiquitous. Some example constructs. Clearly things like cognitive control are very important. Clearly things like working memory are very important. We see these disruptions in schizophrenia spectrum disorders. System for social processes. Very clear the need for those. And arousal and regulatory systems, which are very unique because these really cut across not only the way we function as an organism, but the way that our cells function. So a lot of these systems in the arousal and regulatory systems may have something to do with how our cells are regulating uh, that are relevant for other circuits. So at the outset, the constraints for a construct was strong <coughs> evidence for the validity connected to behavioral or functioning, and also that it mapped onto a biological system. This is about connecting things. 
It's not just about reducing down to the biology. It's important to reduce down to understand component parts. It's equally important to ascend up to understand how those component parts work together for behavior and mind. There is a detailed process to draft the matrix by the working group. Uh, at that time, we sent out a request for information for feedback from the field. Uh, we got a lot of um, feedback from workshops where the constructs were honed and defined, and then those were posted for feedback. And going forward, this project that is continuously changing, uh, the domains and the constructs are open to change depending on uh, the publication of research that looks at the constructs. This is an early draft of the matrix. You can see it's a little bit bare. And you can, I'm skipping that. Um, I was not able to uh, access, uh, just for uh, computer security, the, uh, directly to the, R, uh, uh, to the RDoC website. But a very recent change in the RDoC website has been to organize it in a way where things are all linked together. So this is an example of the negative valence systems in the RDoC matrix. Um, and you can see the constructs there. Um, what you can't see here, because I can't do this though, is that if you click on elements, you'll see genes associated with the elements, circuits, physiology. You can go and move around the matrix this way. And you can go down to look at just acute threat and you can see the description. So here is an example of a description for one of the RDoC constructs that was uh, derived in one of the NIMH RDoC workshops. And then you can go down farther, say if you click on acute threat and fear, and then you can see um, the actually, you can see inside of uh, the matrix, the elements. And so you can see here are genes that are involved, the molecule cells, circuits, physiology, behavior, and paradigms. So what would happen if you clicked on one of these? It would take you, say, for, to a molecule, you could look at uh, cortisol, and it shows where it's related. Now these examples don't include this, but you could imagine clicking on a molecule dopamine and it would be ubiquitous. And then it would list every construct that it's been associated with. So what's essentially, this matrix is trying to begin to represent a nomological network where people can draw connections and the next uh, step in this matrix would be to include publications uh, that are supporting these connections. It's hard to think about this. This is a shift in approach, identifying mechanisms that are normal and working forward to disruptions in clinical problems. As clinicians, as clinical researchers, we have people who come to us who say that they're depressed, and we want to try to figure out what's wrong. We help them with therapy and we help them with research. And to move forward in this, in some ways, it requires a suspension of that idea and that we want to begin to parse the clinical symptoms by links to mechanisms, not descriptive diagnoses, whether we're targeting things along the line of the schizophrenia con uh, spectrum continuum um, or looking at, say, a depression that is more driven by attentional bias than reflective or memory bias. An experimental design is quite different. So your experimental groups in RDoC do not begin with people who suffer major depression, depressive, uh, major depression remitted, and normal controls. But really, anywhere within the matrix, you can have independent and dependent variables. So you might, for instance, looking at people who have cognitive problems, have an independent uh, behavior that you're looking at, like the ability to hold something in working memory, and look and see how that maps to circuits or possibly genes. And that can tell us 
one of the ways that we can begin to draw connections across these different units which have been weak in the past. One thing to do is to think about selecting two or three DSM or ICD groups, each powered for analysis. Um, the BSNP, the Bipolar Schizophrenia Network for Intermediate Phenotypes, is a great example of this, where there are subjects or participants from all categories. Um, and you can do this to um, look at the subgroups and then look at, say, a cross-cutting dimension like cognition. And so this is uh, um, some earlier work, and, it's, and there's been an updated version that just is in press in American Journal of Psychiatry by uh, Carol Taminga, as well as Sweeney and the rest of the BSNP group. But here is, this is a representation of some of their data and the way that we've thought in the past. And the way that we thought in the past is we would look at these two groups, these people you know, who were more bipolar and these people who were more schizophrenic. We would call these schizophrenia and these bipolar. And really, when we look at the cognitive functioning, which is represented here, we see that you know, maybe we should be thinking about this cutting across a different way in the schizophrenia spectrum, much the way that um, we've already heard. So the shift in approach take a breath here. The shift in approach is really to think about taking groups, these heterogeneous groups of people, not restricting, not over-specifying, as has been done, I think, more so with the DSM. The ICD chapters are clearly a major advance. Um, and putting these people together, um, and then once we have them together, to use the different components of the RDOC matrix to parse them out differently, so that you might be clustering them on genetic risk or polygenic risk score, brain activity, physiology, effective bias, things like that. And that becomes your new data-driven categories for which you could begin to consider uh, replication uh, followed by stratified clinical trials. So RDOC going forward. RDOC is owned by the clinical research community. In the United States, people are grumbling about RDOC, uh, in part because they're saying, well, I have to do RDOC to get funded. And it's true that the NIMH is devoting funds to RDOC. But the truth of the matter is, whatever happens to RDOC is in the hands of the community through peer review people serving on grant review committees. There have been set aside monies, but RDOC is a small portion of the NIMH budget. How much will RDOC be embraced by people in the European community? We do have a discussion forum, which you'll find on the website that uh, you can join by contacting NIH. And also, there's the development of an R a subject level database by all RDOC funded grants to collate the data so that more questions can be asked. This is uh, getting the same amount of resources as the uh, NDAR or the Autism Research Database, um, which has proved to be very rich. RDOC is also clearly important for future revisions of the DSMs and the ICDs. Um, and one of the other things that I wanted to say is right now we're really looking at developing paradigms. So one of the things that I did skip over is in our units of analysis we have a paradigms column. And those paradigms are things like a working memory task. Are there things that we can give to our patients that are really looking at their performance that things that are going to tap into what's going on with a disruption in a mechanism that can guide us to develop a better treatment. These are not experimental tasks, and so there's a real chore to develop the psychometrics for these tasks so that we are able to give these tasks for diagnostic purposes with sensitivity and specificity and not to have practice effects and things like that uh, enter into the picture. So. Um, I will just say that really it is a work in progress. It's up to the field. Uh, 
Those of us on the RDOC internal working group really believe that this could help people do things differently, but what is being put out there could be um, taken by the field and changed, and in fact, that would probably be the ultimate um, success if it was embraced that way. So none of the things that you see in the RDOC matrix are uh, tablets in stone, but they are a starting point, our best starting point, and there is consensus involved, like with other diagnostic systems, but the consensus must be closely tied to empirical results, most notably replication. I will just say um, that our doc work group members who are very helpful and the part of making this happen, um, including Bruce Cuthbert, who really pushed through this initiative, especially uh, from uh, around the uh, 2000 when there was difficulties with translational researchers getting funded, what translational researchers are saying now, what researchers who are getting grants are saying now is I'm meeting new people because I'm walking, working across levels of analysis. Uh, Bruce is now the acting director of NIMH since Thomas Insull has gone to Google slash Alphabet. Um, and also our external consultants, uh, Will Carpenter, Deanna Barich, and Michael First have been immensely helpful in developing this project. And there I will stop with posting the uh, website that you can go to.